four days after I was hospitalized from a car accident. Karen, my daughter, visits me almost every day after school. Hey Karen, did you tell your dad about me properly? Yeah. I told him. Hasn't he come to visit you? Despite his wife being hospitalized, Toby, my husband, hasn't visited even once. I felt a bit saddened by his coldness. Two days later, when Karen was visiting because she had no school. Poor thing. You were in an accident, right? Suddenly, my best friend Naomi walked into the hospital room. But I hadn't told Naomi about the accident, so how did she know? Oh, you came together. Toby peeked out from behind Naomi. I have something to talk about. Without any concern for me, Toby continued his story. I'm marrying Naomi. So, divorce me. He boldly announced it loudly in the hospital room. What? What did you say? I said, I love Naomi. We're getting married, so you take Karen and get out. I thought I misheard, so I asked again, but I couldn't comprehend the sudden situation. Naomi, what is this about? It means exactly what it sounds like. I love Toby. Will you give him to me? Naomi's expression was serious. Is it possible for someone to make such a selfish request? Ignoring the two passionate visitors, my daughter burst into laughter. What? You two can't get married. Because. What Karen said was quite unexpected. I, Chris Haddison, enjoy watching slightly complex love dramas in between work and house chores. Wow, that was unexpected. Wait, it ends here. I often find myself exclaiming out loud at the twists in the drama I watch alone. I live a simple life with my husband and daughter, and have a good relationship with my in-laws who live nearby. I am far from the drama-filled stories I watch and lead an ordinary life. Because my daily life is so monotonous, sometimes I wish to dive into a drama. My husband Toby is a bright, athletic moodmaker rather than a scholar. He loves lively gatherings and was always surrounded by people in his youth. To me, who was relatively quiet and studious, he seemed dazzling and attractive. However, I've realized that it's not easy to change the mindset developed in one's youth. Though it was charming when we were young, his unchanged personality at 40 is a bit problematic. What I once found admirable has become a source of concern as we age. My recent worry is about the relationship between Toby and Karen. Karen prefers quiet time over hanging out with friends. She doesn't dress flashily, excels in her studies, and always ranks high in her class. Toby, who despised studying, cannot seem to understand Karen's dedication. It would be fine if he kept it to himself, but he can't help imposing his views. You're always cooped up in your room studying. Girls don't need to study to live. Instead of wasting time on studying, why not learn some charm? He says this loudly enough for Karen to hear while she's studying. Dad, people don't think that way anymore. Without studying, I can't get the job I want. It's my freedom to choose whether I study or not. Despite Karen's rebuttal, Toby always comments whenever he sees her studying. Hey Toby, why don't you stop interrupting Karen's studies? She's doing great. I made friends and got a job without studying. Playing with friends is more fun and you'll never regret it. Toby, indulging in his nostalgic fun, doesn't listen. Karen is getting fed up with Toby's constant interference. Mom, 
How long will dad keep saying such things? I can't concentrate even if I want to study. Sorry, I tell him not to disturb you, but he just doesn't listen no matter how many times I say studying is important. As a result, Toby and Karen clash often, and I have to mediate every time. Toby's interference doesn't stop with Karen herself. Listen, Karen's planning to go to college. A girl doesn't need to study. Toby continues to complain about Karen even in front of his parents. Stop saying girls don't need to study. Nowadays, it doesn't matter if you're a girl or a boy. Instead of criticizing others, why don't you try studying again? My in-laws, unable to bear seeing their beloved granddaughter denied, admonished Toby. When his own parents criticize his views, Toby sulks. What's with everyone? On days when his parents scold him, Toby's complaints worsen and he often gives us the silent treatment. One day, while returning from shopping, Hey, is that you, Chris? It's been ages. Do you remember me? Wow, Naomi. Do you live here now? The one who called out to me was my best friend Naomi, who had moved out of the prefecture after middle school graduation. Naomi was always stylish, with extensive knowledge of makeup and fashion, and I secretly admired her. Though we were opposites in looks and personality, we often hung out together. I used to teach Naomi, who was bad at studying, in exchange for fashion tips. After she moved, we kept in touch through letters, but as we got busier with our social lives, the letters dwindled. It was really a long-awaited reunion. Yeah, I got married and had a child over there, but due to some issues, I'm back here now. That must have been tough. It was. My husband cheated on me. Oh, can I visit your place sometime? I'd love to catch up. Sure, come over. I'd love to chat. Thus, Naomi and I rekindled our friendship and started visiting each other's families. Toby and Naomi, both lively and sociable, quickly hit it off and became close. Whenever Naomi visited, they had animated conversations, as if they had been friends forever. Naomi's daughter, like her, cared about fashion and was around Karen's age. Every time Naomi and her daughter visited, Karen tried to be friendly but didn't seem to get along well. She said it's unthinkable not to be into fashion or romance and called my look plain. She's younger than me but acts superior. Karen, frustrated, would vent to me after they left. Everyone has their own thing, so don't worry. You're fine as you are. I tried to comfort her, but Naomi's daughter continued to pick on Karen. As Naomi and Toby grew closer, Naomi's daughter also got attached to Toby, and he enjoyed it. Naomi's having trouble with her lights. I'm going to check it out on my next day off. It must be hard for her as a single mother. Toby, pitying the single mother household, often helped out at Naomi's place. Toby is so capable and fast. I'll keep asking him for help. Naomi praised Toby in front of me, flattering him. Toby, flattered, became more enamored with Naomi and her family. Naomi started visiting less frequently, while Toby was often away helping her. Dad is visiting Naomi's place too much. Is she really asking for that much help? I don't think Naomi is helpless. Being a single mother is tough. I have to help her. Toby's focus on Naomi's household made both Karen and me increasingly unhappy. Even when I hinted at our discontent, Toby showed no signs of changing. 
When I went to Naomi's house three days in a row, even Karen and I couldn't overlook it. I want you to value our family a bit more. Naomi is just a friend, you know? I just don't understand Dad's thinking. Then Toby, with a sigh, said, I wish Naomi and her family were my real family instead of you boring people. I never expected to hear such words. I was so taken aback that I couldn't respond. The only thing that happened was my affection for Toby gradually faded away. After that incident, the atmosphere at home completely chilled. There was little conversation between the couple, just the bare minimum. Toby and Karen seemed even more distant than before. It's no wonder things turned out this way. I thought to myself, as long as we can live without any issues, that's enough. With that in mind, I went out shopping. It was when I was on my way back, riding my bicycle, that it happened. Suddenly, there was a loud impact and the sound of brakes. When I came to, I was lying on the ground. There was some commotion around me. I opened my eyes gently, but it took some time to grasp the situation. My bicycle had been flung far away, and the items I bought were scattered everywhere. Oh, I've had an accident. Right after thinking that, pain shot through my entire body. I could hear the siren of an ambulance in the distance. Enduring the pain, I waited patiently for the ambulance to arrive. Even during the transport to the hospital, the pain made my consciousness fade in and out. By the time the treatment was finished and I was in the hospital room, Karen had rushed over. Mom. Are you okay? Ah, uh, Karen, I'm sorry to make you worry. I'll have to be hospitalized for a while. I had broken my right leg in the accident. I'm just glad you're alive. I was really worried. I hope you recover well. I felt sorry for worrying Karen. I don't remember much about the moments before and after the accident, but I'm truly glad to be alive. For now, I'll focus on getting better. And so, my life in the hospital began. On the fourth day of my hospitalization, Karen visited me almost every day after school. But Toby hadn't come even once. I'm sure he knows about my accident and that I'm in the hospital with a broken leg. Or maybe Karen didn't tell him because she didn't want to talk to him? Hey, Karen, did you tell your dad about my situation properly? Yeah, I told him. Hasn't dad come to visit? No, not even once. But it's okay as long as you told him. The hospital must have contacted him too. Dad should at least come to visit. Though we only have the bare minimum of conversations at home, he should still come to visit his hospitalized wife at least once. I felt a bit saddened by Toby's coldness. Two days later, Karen, who was off from school, was visiting me. Chris. You poor thing. You had an accident, didn't you? Somehow, Naomi, who shouldn't have known, entered my hospital room. I was wondering how she knew, and then Toby quietly appeared behind her. I finally thought he had come to visit, but he came with Naomi. I guess he's using my hospitalization as an excuse to meet Naomi freely. I didn't expect him to bring Naomi along even though I wasn't expecting much concern. Oh, Naomi. You came together. Then Toby, who had been silent, spoke up. Chris, I have something to talk about. Without any concern for me, Toby continued his own story. I'm marrying Naomi. So, let's get a divorce. 
Karen and I exchanged glances, both tilting our heads. What? What did you say? I asked again, thinking I misheard. I love Naomi. We're getting married, so you and Karen need to leave. I couldn't understand what he was saying at all. It was like a scene from a drama I always watch. I thought it wouldn't help to talk to the excited Toby, so I decided to ask Naomi. Naomi, what does he mean? It means exactly what it says. I love Toby. I need Toby. You two haven't been getting along anyway, right? Why not let me have him? Naomi's expression was serious. Is there such a selfish thing? Of all people, my husband. A real friend wouldn't do this. You're the only one who thought of her as a friend. What do you mean? Hey, Naomi. After Toby called out, Naomi started to speak. Chris, you've always been plain. From the start, you and I were mismatched. But you were smart, so I stayed close to you because it was convenient. Thanks to you, I aced those tests back then. Naomi had only seen me as a convenient tool, and I was the only one who thought of her as a friend. Feeling pleased with herself, Naomi continued. Toby and I get along, and he seems happier with me. I think I'm more suited to be his wife. Naomi said this with a sly smile and then whispered in my ear. And it seems like he has a lot of money too. Apparently, Naomi was attracted by Toby's good salary and pretended to be troubled to start an affair. She intended to kick Karen and me out and take my place. Toby seemed to have genuinely fallen for Naomi's seduction. With my hospitalization, they saw it as the perfect chance to push for a divorce while I couldn't move. I almost sighed at their reckless actions. I can't believe something like this is happening to me. Naomi and Toby, with triumphant expressions, waiting for me to surrender. While watching the two of them getting carried away, I was thinking about what to do. Then Karen, who had been silent all this time, started laughing. What? You two can't get married. Did you know, Dad? Karen's words were surprising. Naomi is in the middle of a divorce mediation because of her own affair. She's being demanded a lot of alimony. When we reconnected, Naomi had said her husband had cheated on her, but that was a complete lie. It was actually Naomi's affair that led to her being told to separate, and she was now in the middle of divorce mediation. And during this mediation, she was looking for her next financial base and found Toby. Naomi planned to divorce her husband and wait for six months to remarry, ensuring Toby would marry her. Moreover, she intended to use Toby's money to pay the alimony to her husband and her affair partner's wife by controlling the household finances after remarrying. That's not true. I really love Toby. Naomi raised her voice. But Karen continued speaking calmly. Naomi's daughter told me everything. She talked a lot. Well, in the end, she mocked me, saying that mom and I would be abandoned. Karen had sensed the relationship between Toby and Naomi. Predicting this outcome, she had been investigating using Naomi's daughter. Naomi's daughter looked down on Karen, so when Karen told her about the divorce crisis, she spilled all the family details to feel superior. Thanks to that, Karen learned about Naomi's plans and was ready to use it as a trump card when necessary. I was impressed by my daughter's ability to judge situations calmly and gather information. Perhaps it's due to my daily guidance. 
The knowledge about divorce and trials I gained from dramas had paid off here. Though still a high school student, I thought my daughter had impressive insight and action. Realizing her plan had been exposed, Naomi frantically called her daughter. What are you blabbing about? You've ruined my plan. I'm broke now. I had finally found a good money source. Naomi began arguing with her daughter over the phone. Hearing this, Toby finally realized he had been seduced for his money. What? He was stunned and couldn't find words. Moreover, Naomi had chosen Toby because she thought he was the president and thus very wealthy. In reality, Toby only worked at his in-law's company, but he had pretended to be the president to impress Naomi. Toby's usual flamboyance and vanity had backfired. I couldn't help but laugh at the absurdity. Having realized Naomi's plan and true intentions, Toby panicked. I'm sorry. Chris. Please take back what I said earlier. What did you say earlier? Karen's calm question made Toby flustered. I didn't mean the divorce. It was just a spur-of-the-moment thing. Looking down, Toby glanced at me, who was silently listening. Chris. Are you listening? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Even if he was deceived, I can't forgive Toby for cheating with Naomi. If Toby had any sense, this wouldn't have happened. Karen and I both felt the same about not being able to forgive Toby. Toby, seeing that we weren't saying anything, finally spoke up. But you two can't live without my income, right? It would be tough if we got divorced. He showed regret for just a moment, then quickly started threatening us with how difficult life would be without his income. Toby seemed to think that Karen and I couldn't manage without him. We can live just fine without you, Toby. As you said, let's get divorced. And I'll make sure to inform your parents about everything that's happened. No, please don't tell them. I'm begging you, don't. It doesn't change what happened. For now, I sent him home and sighed deeply in the hospital room. I wondered how the protagonist of a drama would handle this situation. But deep down, I already knew my answer. First, I needed to heal my leg. After a few days, thanks to rehab, I got good at using crutches. At home, I still had to use crutches, but I managed my daily life without much trouble. Even after I was discharged, Toby kept asking me to reconsider the divorce. But I remained silent, and Karen blamed him every time she saw him. Toby started feeling uncomfortable at home and began living in a hotel. A few days later, my in-laws came to visit after hearing about my discharge. Chris, you must have had a hard time. Are you okay? I brought some frozen meals to help. She was very considerate of my health. By the way, Toby took a day off work yesterday. Is he not feeling well? Well, he's actually living in a hotel now. The thing is, I explained everything to my in-laws, from Toby and Naomi's meeting to their affair. He cheated on me with my friend and then came to the hospital with her to ask for a divorce. They said they wanted Karen and me to move out so they could live here together. Is that true? What's he thinking? There's more. I explained that Naomi was in the middle of a divorce settlement and burdened with alimony debt, and that she intended to remarry Toby to use his money to cover it. To begin with, I think it was wrong for Toby to boast about being the company president. He said he was the CEO. That's ridiculous. I can't believe he tried to abandon you and Karen. 
We need to talk to him. Yeah, we need to set him straight. Later, we called Toby to my in-law's house for a discussion. So, you cheated? Toby looked ashamed and remained silent. You not only cheated but also tried to kick out Chris and Karen. What's wrong with you? How could you try to abandon your wife and child? Finally, Toby spoke up. It's not like that. I was deceived. He claimed he was manipulated into wanting a divorce. If I had known she was after money, I wouldn't have done it. It's all because Chris reconnected with her. Toby tried to shift the blame. Seeing his lack of remorse, my father-in-law's face turned stern. Are you saying it's not your fault? Cheating is cheating. And you lied about being the CEO. I thought you might take over one day, but I can't trust you now. You're fired. My father-in-law was furious and announced Toby's disownment. My mother-in-law looked disgusted. I'm so disappointed in you, Toby. I'm sorry. Don't apologize to me. Apologize to Chris. Chris, I'm really sorry. Please, give me another chance. Seeing him about to be disowned, I felt a bit sorry for him. If I left him too, he'd be all alone. But my mother-in-law's words gave me the resolve I needed. Chris, do what you think is best. We're on your side. Her words solidified my decision. Let's get divorced. We can't go back to how things were. Please, reconsider. No, I've decided. I will make sure to get alimony and child support. How did it come to this? And so, we proceeded with the divorce. A few days later, I got a call from Naomi. Hey. My husband found out everything. Now I have to pay even more. This is unbelievable. During her divorce settlement, Naomi's husband found out about her affair with Toby and increased her alimony. He also sued Toby for compensation. Toby ended up losing most of his assets to alimony and child support. The scandal quickly spread in our small town, and Naomi found it hard to live there. She moved to a nearby town but struggled with her new, poorer lifestyle. Toby also started a new life, getting a job somewhere else. His previous lax work ethic didn't help, and he kept failing at his new job. Frustrated, he turned to gambling, falling into a vicious cycle of debt. A while after the divorce, Toby called me. I'm sorry, but I can't make the payments this month. I'm short on money. He sounded weak. I felt sorry but didn't know how to help. I heard from my in-laws that Toby had also asked them for money. Dad, can you lend me some money? I'm really struggling. With growing debts and no way out, Toby was desperate. But both my in-laws and I refused to help. I hoped he would eventually get out of gambling and pay off his debts steadily. Meanwhile, Karen and I continued to have a good relationship with my in-laws. They might have felt guilty for Toby's actions, but their kindness was a great comfort. Karen kept studying hard and got into her dream university. With my income and help from my in-laws, she thrived in college and is on her way to becoming a researcher. How was today's story? Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you in the next video. You need to run away by next Monday. It was a call from my mother-in-law who had disappeared a year ago. Honestly, I didn't like her very much. When we lived together, she would often make snide remarks about various things. 
I even thought it would be better if she disappeared. And then she actually did. Where are you? I thought it might be my fault somehow, but hearing her voice, I felt relieved. But at that moment, I still didn't understand anything. The call from my mother-in-law was just the beginning of the events that were about to unfold. My name is Mandy Jones. Shortly after becoming a working adult, I lost my parents to illness and found myself struggling without anyone to rely on. At the age of 27, during a short trip to take a break, I met William, who would become my husband. We discovered that we were from the same hometown and immediately hit it off. I ended up sharing the fact that I didn't have parents anymore, and he kindly listened to my story. After returning to our hometown, we continued to meet frequently, and within less than a year, we got married. I moved in with him and his parents. My father-in-law owned a large real estate agency in the area and was wealthy, owning a significant amount of land. We're just a normal family. In their 30 years of marriage, I've never seen my parents argue. Wow, they seem like such a loving couple. Yeah, I hope we can be like them. I felt completely at ease and reassured by William's reliability and kindness. At that time, I was filled with anticipation, believing that happy days would continue forever. However, a few days after moving in, I noticed something strange. My mother-in-law, Patricia, was acting oddly. While she was kind in front of the family, her demeanor changed drastically when we were alone and she became suddenly cold towards me. Is this how you cleaned? Unbelievable. It'll be turned into a garbage house. She would often criticize my cleaning and make me redo it countless times. I desperately tried to earn her approval, but no matter what I did, I couldn't win her favor. This house isn't suitable for you. You should just pack up and leave. I still remember the chill that ran down my spine when she said those words so clearly. Despite enduring it, a decisive event happened on my husband's birthday. On that day, I was making a homemade cake for William's birthday. Just as it was finished, my mother-in-law barged into the kitchen. You're going to feed my son such a terrible-looking cake made by an amateur? Is this some kind of sabotage? After hurling insults, she attempted to throw the cake directly into the trash. I tried to stop her, and we ended up in a physical struggle, causing her to fall over. At the sound of the commotion, my husband rushed over. As I tried to explain the situation, to my surprise, my mother-in-law portrayed me as the villain and began to cry while pleading to him. Mandy suddenly pushed me. I don't want such a scary daughter-in-law. Despite her convincing performance, I had previously confided in William about some of the things that had been happening, so he took my side. This incident also reached my father-in-law, George, and scolded my mother-in-law for her behavior. Unable to bear the situation any longer, she sulked and lashed out in anger. If everyone is going to treat me like a nobody, then I might as well disappear." She yelled loudly and then locked herself in her room. I thought she was just being dramatic, trying to get attention from my husband and father-in-law. However, the next morning, we found out that she had left behind divorce papers and disappeared. Did she really leave for good? I asked anxiously, but my father-in-law just smiled as if nothing had happened. She was treating you badly behind us, right? That's why I kicked her out. Don't worry, she'll come back once she's cooled off. The divorce papers were just for show. His expression remained kindly, but I couldn't shake the feeling of discomfort at his extreme reaction. However, my husband seemed to have no doubts about his father's actions. 
I wondered if it was right for my father-in-law to do this to a wife who had never fought with him for 30 years. However, I felt hesitant to interfere in their marital affairs and decided to silently observe. But even though we thought she would return soon, a week passed and she still hadn't come back. At this point, I even started to worry. Is Patricia really okay? I hope nothing bad has happened to her or she hasn't been involved in some sort of incident. She'll be fine. This village is peaceful, you know. Maybe she's just gone back to her parents' house to relax. I was exasperated by his carefree response. However, that night, I witnessed something shocking. My husband was rummaging through my mother-in-law's room, humming to himself as he packed her belongings into trash bags. Seeing him haphazardly discard her belongings, I couldn't believe it was just a simple cleanup. Could it be that they've already accepted she won't be coming back? I couldn't shake off the increasing anxiety about my mother-in-law's safety and what my husband and father-in-law were thinking. Despite suggesting multiple times that we should search for her, my father-in-law just shook his head. We know where she is. She doesn't want to come back yet, so leave her be. His firm tone left me unable to push further. And before I knew it, a year had passed since my mother-in-law disappeared. Around that time, there was a significant event that I might have become pregnant. My attention was fully focused on that. Let's go to the obstetrician next Monday. I hope we have a baby. I smiled at my husband's excited voice and looked forward to the appointment at the hospital. Amidst all this, I received a call from my mother-in-law on my phone. Are you still at home? I was truly surprised to hear her voice after a year. Despite our disagreement before she disappeared, I still felt responsible if something had happened to her. Knowing she was safe, regardless of how uneasy our relationship was, brought me relief. Where on earth are you? That doesn't matter right now. What's important is that you leave the house immediately. Her usual condescending tone made my relief vanish, and I felt a strong urge to push back. I told her there was a possibility that I was pregnant and already made an appointment for the checkup. So, I won't obey your orders. However, her response to this was unexpected. Then, all the more reason. You need to run away by next Monday. What? What do you mean? At that moment, my mother-in-law revealed a shocking truth to me. The incident that seemed to have been resolved when she contacted me, but it was just the tip of the iceberg, hiding a much darker reality. I understand. But I won't run away. After hearing my mother-in-law's words, I struggled with my decision. If what she said was true, running away wouldn't solve anything. I decided to take action to confirm the truth with my own eyes. And so, amidst swirling uncertainties, Monday arrived. I got into the car with my husband and father-in-law, heading to the obstetrician in the neighboring town. Throughout the journey, they showed genuine concern for my well-being, appearing to be nothing but good husband and father-in-law. However, unable to accept their kindness wholeheartedly, I had mixed emotions in the car. After finishing my examination at the hospital, I was waiting in the waiting room with my husband and father-in-law when an elderly nurse approached us. Regarding the earlier results, Mandy, you are indeed pregnant. Really? Yes. Beside him, my father-in-law nodded repeatedly, looking satisfied. Finally, I'll get to meet my first grandchild. I'm looking forward to it. At that moment, when my father-in-law muttered those words, the nurse's demeanor suddenly changed. 
she glared at my father-in-law and husband with wide-opened eyes, and she shouted loudly. A first grandchild, huh? Liar. You're all despicable. My husband was taken aback by the sudden outburst, but as he gazed closely at the nurse's face, he seemed to finally realize something. Are you? Mom. Why are you here? Dressed as a nurse. It's no wonder my husband didn't realize it. My mother-in-law had disguised herself with a wig and glasses to avoid being easily recognized. While my husband and father-in-law were stunned, I quickly moved behind my mother-in-law. She shielded me, a cold sweat running down her face. This hospital is run by a friend of mine. I've been hiding here all along. So, this is where you've been hiding. I was hoping you'd have collapsed somewhere. I was left speechless by my father-in-law's uncharacteristic remark. The kind tone he usually had was nowhere to be found. Instead, he looked like a villainous old man. So, is the pregnancy a lie? It's true. But that's why I can't let Mandy go with you. As my mother-in-law held my hand, I felt her small hand trembling. From this, I realized that she was truly afraid of my father-in-law. We finally have our first grandchild. We need to take her home and let her rest. What do you mean, first grandchild? Is your memory getting worse? As my mother-in-law spoke, three young female nurses who had been nearby stepped forward, blocking my husband and father-in-law. Seeing their faces, my husband was visibly shaken. You? What are you doing here? It seems William remembered well. Of course, I wasn't planning to let you get away with saying you forgot. Seeing my husband's frustrated expression, I couldn't help but feel sad. The young women were not nurses but girls from the village where William's family lived. It was none other than me who had gathered them here. The stories I heard from your mother were true after all. As I watched my husband and father-in-law's facades crumble away, I felt like reality was about to shatter me. I learned of this shocking truth from a phone call from my mother-in-law. There was a reason she urged me to escape from my in-law's house as soon as possible. William has already fathered children with three different women and heartlessly abandoned them. He even threatened to kick them out of the village if anyone made a fuss and has been hiding it. However, it was hard to believe such a dramatic story right away. First of all, my husband and father-in-law were kind in front of me, and my mother-in-law was always against me. I've been too afraid to tell anyone about my husband for a long time. But you, you've always faced me head on. I couldn't let such a good person like you be left in the dark. Even through the phone, her trembling voice didn't sound like she was lying. So, I decided to confirm the truth before Monday's appointment and made this plan. I talked to them too. They've all been holding a grudge against you for a long time. When I told them about today, they were happy to come. I asked them to help me create a situation where the true nature of our husbands could be revealed. All three of them agreed without hesitation. Just seeing their reactions gave a glimpse of the depth of the wrongdoing our husbands had committed. Why did you hurt so many people? Don't get it twisted. I am the victim here. He began making outrageous excuses with a brash attitude. I needed an heir. I'm wealthy and powerful. But these women could only produce girls. They're just from poor bloodlines. Utterly useless. But you loved them, didn't you? Why say such cruel things? I didn't love them. Women are just tools for producing children. Hearing such words delivered with a straight face sent shivers down my spine. 
Alongside my anger, questions began to arise within me. If you have no attachment to women, then why did you marry me? You used to say kind words to me. Because there were only incompetents in the village, so I was looking for women elsewhere. Then, you just happened to catch my eye when I was on a trip. Plus, I liked your face. My husband replied, not showing any remorse but rather wearing a proud smile. You were all alone in the world, weren't you? It's good you have a family now. Just give birth to children and then focus on childcare and housework as a maid. Well, that's if the child is a boy. If the baby in my belly were a girl, he would have easily abandoned me too? As I already lost my parents and had no support, I must have seemed like the perfect target for his plan. His intentions were clear, and I felt nothing but despair. You said it to me, didn't you? Let's become a couple like your parents, without any fights. Was that also a lie? That's true. My parents were the ideal couple. I aim to be like them. It's not like we never fought. My mother-in-law, who had been silent until now, interjected. I. I was just obeying because your father was violent and scary. I endured being treated horribly all by myself. Finally, I understood why her hands were shaking. My mother-in-law had been enduring frightening experiences from my father-in-law for a long time. My husband, mistakenly idealizing their master-servant-like relationship, took them as a model. Despite witnessing the village girls being victimized, my mother-in-law couldn't act due to her fear of my father-in-law. But I've made up my mind too. To prevent further victims, we'll protect Mandy. I won't let you lay a finger on her either. Seeing us united. My father-in-law clicked his tongue in frustration. Perhaps I didn't discipline you enough. With that, my father-in-law aggressively approached us, raising his fist toward my mother-in-law and me. But in the next moment, other male nurses rushed over and tackled him, preventing him from going any further. Who do you think you're dealing with? True to his nature, he immediately tried to resort to violence. He shouted arrogantly, but we were no longer in the village but in a hospital in a different town. Once out of the village, his power amounted to nothing. Unable to do anything further, he was restrained along with my husband. Please call the police. I'm begging you. The police? Wait a minute, I haven't done anything yet. Unlike my father. I shouldn't have any reason to be arrested. What did you say? Are you planning to betray your own father? The prestigious Jones family will be shocked to hear this. My father-in-law remained arrogant, but I was no longer afraid. Supporting my mother-in-law, I faced him head on. The prestigious lineage you're so proud of will crumble because of your foolish actions. News involving the police will spread quickly in the village. Stop it. If that happens, we'll lose our dignity. Yes, and not just that. You'll lose everything, including your place. Suddenly, my husband, who had been assertive just moments ago, completely changed his tone, adopting a soothing voice. Honey, I was threatened by my father. That's why I said those awful things. Deep down, I love you. And all those stories about other women were lies. You're the only one I've ever loved. Whether their stories are lies or not, it's not up to you to decide. I'll be the judge of that. And I'll do DNA tests on the children to find out who's telling the truth. At my words, my husband turned pale. It was as if just that reaction alone revealed everything. 
with my husband and father-in-law looking utterly miserable. They were pushed into the police car and taken to the station. The next day, my father-in-law was released, but rumors spread throughout the village like wildfire. My husband found himself completely isolated due to his past misdeeds. He was sued by the other women, and after DNA testing confirmed his paternity, he was ordered to pay each of them $30,000 in compensation. I naturally divorced my husband and received a total of $150,000 in compensation and child support. My father-in-law's real estate business closed down, and feeling unwelcome in the village, they both fled hastily. Later, I heard through the grapevine that they were living together in a rundown apartment without a bathroom. As for me, I decided to start fresh and move to the neighboring town. I asked my mother-in-law, who had nowhere else to go, to live with me. My mother-in-law deeply regretted her decision to run away once before. However, through this ordeal, I felt like we truly became mother and daughter. Now, we live happily under the same roof, eagerly awaiting the arrival of the baby.